Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Well, thank you all for coming to uh, beautiful Myrick O'Connell. Um, we had um, we agreed to do this as the second of the presentations that we're, that we're doing because we had done one in Worcester, actually, in uh, January at our Myrick office in conjunction with the, um, the ombudsman from uh, Montachusetts slash Central Mass. And the goal of the exercise was really to get folk, folk people focused on Jimmo versus Sebelius um, because we'd been following the case, um, we were aware of it, um, we knew that real human beings were not aware of it. We were, we were also aware of the fact that nursing homes kind of were not aware of it. And so we were just trying to get, get folks more focused on it. And so uh, at our, when we were speaking to the, the, uh, some folks at the, I, we actually did a presentation to all of the ombudsmen back in um, last October uh, in Boston talked about Jim O, talked about the implications for it, and at that time several people said, well, you know, maybe we should try to do something locally. So the goal of the exercise is to, for here is to just kind of talk about Jim O, talk about what it is conceptually, and what it is conceptually is fairly straightforward, but then talk about some real examples. Um, as I tell people, and I've also done it, we've also done a couple presentations to consumers on this, because it's really important <coughs> for us as an elder law matter. Um, I am, my, my name is Arthur Bridgestone, by the way. I don't think I introduced myself. I work at Myrick O'Connell. I'm on the elder law side. Myrick is a large firm. We have 52 lawyers. We actually do a lot of stuff on the other side. For example, I was just speaking to uh, Mr. Murphy from uh, Beaumont. We actually do work for the Beaumont system on the, on the, uh, on the healthcare side. We represent UMass Medical. So we've, we've heard a lot about these kinds of issues kind of from all sides, right? So we wanted to talk about Jimmo today. We wanted to talk about that general framework. And then we asked um, Debbie Gittner and Linda Sullivan, who are a terrific um, geriatric care manager team, um, to kind of go into the weeds more, talk about some examples of cases which, which might not have ended up getting qualification um, from Medicare before GEMO, right, but are probably eligible now as a result of GEMO, right? So my, the, when I'm talking to folks in general on the consumer side, I'm talking about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, um, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They are, um, they have their very simple goals. They, they live in their house. They want to live in their house till they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. When one of them dies, they want to leave all their assets to their spouse. After that, they want to divide everything up among the kids, right? Everybody has heard that case a thousand times. Um, they've got pretty much traditional assets. They own a house. They've got an annuity. They've got, they've, they've got adequate income. They've got enough to live on comfortably as long as things don't collapse for them. The thing that they worry about the most is medical care. Right? They're aware of the fact that it is only medical care that can completely wipe them out. As a matter of fact, historically, before Medicare, it's an interesting, just as an aside, it's an interesting thing about what happened as a result of Medicare. In 1960, before Medicare, 33% of all people over 60 in this country were poor. It is hard today to conceive of that. Right? Today, that number is 6%. Right? The reason for that mainly is Medicare. It, in the 1960s, Social Security had already been around for like 30 years, right? But still, it's this huge problem because when you got old, you didn't have health insurance. You got sick, you got wiped out. So now, with Medicare, um, typically people have been saved, right? Except if you have Alzheimer's. And the reason why people talk to elder law attorneys so often is because if you've got Alzheimer's, and so you, the kind of care you need is not quote-unquote skilled care, um, you, you get wiped out unless you qualify for mass health and you know, kind of this, all of that. So that's, those are my typical clients. So in, and what Mary worries about, Mary worries, worries a lot about whether or not, or if she goes to a nursing home, what is going to happen to her if she goes to a nursing home. So as we've talked about and as you folks 
No, the basic rule regarding nursing home care is you have to have spent three days admitted to a hospital. You're all aware of what's going on with admission versus observation. We feel it a lot. I feel it on the other side. I'm one of the trustees at Marlboro Hospital. So we've seen our numbers, just this direct correlation where the number of admissions has gone down and the number of observations has gone up by almost the exact same number. Everybody's getting killed by that. But, we, but once again, this case does not affect that. This case does not affect the 100-day rule if you're in the nursing home. Whether you're on GEMA or not, at the end of 100 <coughs> days, you don't, you know, you're not going to qualify anymore. Um, the main question is, are you getting better? Are you getting better? Um, the, the purpose of the GEMO case was prior to GEMO, um, and you've all heard the kind of magic words, the rule was if you had plateaued, if you were not getting better um, and you were in the nursing home, Medicare was going to stop your payments. Um, there, there had been, prior to GEMO, three federal court cases in various jurisdictions across the country. In each of those cases, the plaintiffs had said, the, the plaintiff who were always individuals had said, that's not what the Medicare statute says. That's how it's being interpreted, but that's not what the Medicare statute says. The statute says um, that if you need skilled care, whether you're getting better or not, you're entitled to get paid by Medicare. All of those cases had been won by the plaintiffs, but in none of those cases was the, was the, was the federal government, was Medicare, willing to concede the point and apply the standard nationally until finally GEMO came. GEMO was done by the Center for Medicare Advocacy, which is a, a, um, a uh, basically a nonprofit legal advocacy firm in Connecticut. The lawyers who did this case were actually Massachusetts lawyers. They did it in conjunction with um, Vermont Legal Aid, uh, but also backed by several large national associations, among them the Alzheimer's Association, because they realized the implications of this for the folks that we deal with that, and Tracy Engel is here, a, a wonderful elder law attorney who lives close by. The people that we deal with regularly, we knew were going to be affected by this case. Um, and what ended up happening was there, there was a, um, a motion to dismiss by the government. Uh, they, they, as, a, as the attorneys uh, talk about it, they say they got the luck of the draw. They hit the right judge in the federal district court in Vermont who they thought was going to kind of go their way. The federal government tried to get the case dismissed, um, failed, then made a deal. And the deal, uh, which was made actually a year ago uh, in January of 2013, it was agreed would apply starting in 2000, or that, that the announcement of it would occur starting in 2014. <coughs> and it was pretty straightforward. Um, the, the, the question of Medicare coverage is determined strictly on, on the basis of whether or not skilled care is needed. Is skilled care needed? Um, it has nothing to do with whether the person is getting better. The skilled care can be, well, I shouldn't say nothing. If the skilled care is needed either in order to cause the individual to improve or to cause the individual to stay the same, to stay plateaued, to keep from getting worse, or even if they're getting worse when they're in the facility, if the care is necessary to keep them getting from getting worse at a more rapid rate, in any of those cases, Medicare is supposed to be paying. Um, this is obviously fundamental. And by the way, in this case, the defense that the Center for Medicare Advocacy made um, to the case was, well, you know, it doesn't say in our regulations any place that if you plateaued, you get knocked off of Medicare. Um, but then the, the Center for Medicare Advocacy said, yeah, but your contractors have regularly enforced the law that way. There's nothing in writing, but we all know that that's what the rule has been, right? Uh, and they convinced the judge of that. So um, that's basically what, so what ended up happening was there was this settlement agreement. The settlement agreement is binding. It is actually binding on all cases as of the time that this case was brought, which was in, in uh, 2011. So, there was actually a special process um, that, was, that is called for under the settlement agreement that says basically if you have somebody who was denied care during those years, um, even though te it technically the, the, the period of appeal has passed, you can actually bring that case back uh, and Medicare will come back and look at it. And it, has been, it is my understanding, it is my understanding that those cases have been so far very successful uh, in front of 
in front of um, the Medicare, the, uh, the uh, appeals groups. Once again, remember, you're still limited to the 100 days. Um, uh, Frank and Mary obviously would still rather be getting home, so they'd rather not be staying the 100 days. One of the interesting things, though, that has happened, oh, uh, and I'm just going to mention this for a, for a second. One of the things, uh, the, the uh, interesting that, the things that has happened under this, right, is, and we were talking about this before the seminar, what, what is, what, what has, is being found across the country is that despite GMO, or that GMO is seldom being brought up, because there are these countervailing forces. On the one hand, you have GMO, which is suggesting that there's going to be a lot more care that needs to be delivered. On the other hand, from the nursing homes' perspectives, um, you've got the Accountable Care Act. You've got these accountable care organizations that are really going to the nursing homes right now and trying to push down the number of days that people are staying in the nursing homes. So, it, so whereas it was expected that as a result of GMO, the number of nursing home days was going to be going up of Medicare nursing home days was going to be going up. In, in fact, there isn't any evidence right now to suggest that that's really happening. Um, so, um, one, just one other little piece that I wanted to mention, which you sh should be aware of, although it doesn't affect you directly as far as the skilled nursing facilities is concerned. Um, we think that the place, and as an a elder law attorney, that the place where this is going to, to hit um, Alzheimer's people, the, I want to say, hit them the hardest, the way that it, place that it can improve their lives the most is regarding the 60-day plans. So if the VNA is certifying that somebody needs skilled care, um, as you know, even though if they haven't been to the hospital, um, they can get a 60-day plan approved and paid for uh, and with the services delivered by skill, skilled care practitioners, through the, typically through the VNAs for 60-day periods, and those 60-day periods can go forever. Um, that, to me, is going to be really significant as far as Alzheimer's folks are concerned. Because um, on, the, on the care side, in terms of what care plans look like, the Alzheimer's Association is, is really trying to develop and has developed a body of data suggesting that for the Alzheimer's patient, you can keep the Alzheimer's patient's symptoms from um, increasing and you can keep him physically and mentally from deteriorating by really have, having substantial things happen at home. If those substantial things need to be coordinated by an occupational therapist or other skilled practitioner, then the argument can be made that a package of those services should be coverable by Medicare so that you don't have, you may not have people facing typically this kind of, uh, this unfortunate either it's all private pay or you've got to be doing all the asset shifting or running out of money so that you can qualify for mass health. So we think that that's going to be a real possibility. So that's the background. Uh, now we wanted to talk, and, and, and when I do presentations to individuals or to elders, I keep telling them that to me the most important player in this that they can have for themselves is a geriatric care manager. Because of course my clients are clueless about what any of this stuff means. So are we. As attorneys, this isn't what we do for a living. We can't read charts. We can't tell you whether there's a particular therapy regimen that's going to keep a person stable or that's going to reduce the chance that they're going to get worse. That really requires people with that kind of experience. Linda Sullivan and Deb Gittner um, from Elder Care Resource Services. I always get the name wrong. Is that right? Elder Care Resource Services, right? Have that kind of experience. So what we asked them to do uh, was we asked them to, to Give, you, give us a couple of, of actually three cases um, and talk about in each one of those cases how GMO might apply to that case. Um, so Linda Sullivan and Deb Gittner. And what I'd, what I'd like to have them do when they do that presentation is to present the case, talk about it, and then we'll take any questions regarding that case. And then we'll just move to the next case, okay? Thank you. Good. Thank you.